Welcome everyone. I'm glad you're here. We have an outstanding presentation prepared for you. Our friend Lisa Hansen from Seton Hall University in New Jersey is here to tell you how college decisions are made. Great, thanks Amy. Welcome everyone. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Oh dear, I hope you can see that. Okay, hold on. Here we go. I don't, oh, here we go. Okay. Can you see that okay, Amy? Yes. Great. So yes, yeah, so welcome. I'm really excited to be talking to you today, to you today about this particular um, subject matter. And I know there's a lot of questions that you might have about senior. There are some additional questions that you likely will have this year, given the situation that our country is in and, and the world. And so I'll go ahead and get started. As Amy said, my name is Lisa Hansen, and I work for Seton Hall University. There's my contact info. I will also have it at, again at the end um, on the slide. So, and um, just a little about Seton Hall, I won't go into the whole deal, but um, let's see, how is, I don't know why it's not advancing. Oh, here we go, okay. So there's a shot of our campus. It's a beautiful campus, but in a nutshell, Seton Hall is um, like, like Amy mentioned in so, South um, Orange, New Jersey. Lisa, we I want to We are located interrupt. just 14 miles outside of New York City. So I'll a little bit more detail. Uh, Lisa, it's not. It, oh, now it's advancing on our end. Okay, never mind. Okay. There we go. Can you still hear me? Okay. So the first thing uh, I want to talk to you about is the college profile. So when you're looking at various uh, types of uh, universities, uh, there are a lot of different types of admission that you might look into. Number one is called open enrollment. What that means is some universities will actually only read that you have a high school degree or um, you know completed, and that can even mean all you would really need to enroll or apply to that university and enroll is a GED as well. So there are universities that do exist with it's kind of what we would con consider maybe a more minimum requirement, obviously. And then we go into the highly Okay, so Lisa, I think um, our presenter might have gotten dropped. I don't see her, so I'm going to see if she um, joins us again, which I'm sure she will. And um, just bear with us for a second. I'm I think here, but I don't know. I, Amy, I'm here to delay, and um, I'm not sure it, it said I disconnect. I think that, um, yeah, the, the connection isn't reason, very strong. So sure what happened there okay so um try sharing your screen again oh is it my internet i think it might Let's be see. your internet it be fine but okay there we go
Okay. Am I back? Yes. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry about that. Um, that hasn't been happening all day, so that's kind of strange. Okay. Should I start over or where I was? I think if you start where you were, that'll be okay. Okay. Let's try this again. Okay. Okay, can you see that, Amy? Yes. Excellent. Okay. So what I'll start off with is the college profile. I'm not sure where I uh, where you lost me last time, but um, really varies uh, in admissions types uh, from one university to the next. Open enrollment really means that a school would just require as minimum requirement as your GED or your um, proof that you've graduated from high school. And that is really kind of what the minimum requirement would be for these types of universities. And then we go up to selective universities. So admissions um, acceptance rates for selective universities can really vary from anywhere down to about 40% up to 60 or 70%. Um, and right around that 65 to 70% acceptance rate is the national average, just in case you didn't know that. It kind of helps um, give some relief to some of the students out there because not every school is going to look for um, anywhere from 4 to 30%. Anywhere between those ranges, 4 to 30%, which, you know, there are some, we know some around here, Stanford, Berkeley, et cetera. Um, they are considered very highly selective. So um, there really is a range of different kinds of acceptance rates. So you have a variety of schools that you can choose from on, in, that, in that regard. So obviously the acceptance profile is going to be based upon what is their average GPA, SAT or ACT score. So test scores and GPA requirements can really vary widely from one university to the next. When we do talk about average, I want to kind of explain that a little bit too. Most of the time when you're talking to an admissions counselor like myself and or Amy, because she's going to be helping you as well, what, it, um, what we mean by average usually means the mid 50%. So that means you're going to be looking at, um, there are students that are going to get admitted to that particular university with um, on the lower 25% as well as the higher 25%. So if, if, a, if a university says 3.6, for example, is their average, then don't think that's the minimum. Because So just don't get um, misled by that. Obviously, different states and regions are going to vary as far as acceptance rates. Majors that they offer, different universities might have more selective requirements, more rigorous requirements for, let's say, an engineering program or a medical school or something of that nature. So just keep those uh, aspects in mind when you're thinking about applying. Also, um, you uh, might want to make sure, we're gonna get into this a little bit more in depth later, but the deadlines, is, uh, they're very important to keep track of. And any kind of new programs that you might be interested are good to keep track of as well. Let's see, I'm looking for the advance, but I don't see it. There we go, okay, great. So different types of application review. Um, you might hear you know, uh, admissions counselors talk about these. So a more holistic approach just means that a university is going to look at every aspect of your application. So they're not going to only be reviewing your GPA and test scores. Um, they're also going to be looking at your essays. They're going to be looking at your letters, letters of recommendation and all the other um, aspects of the application that are presented when you apply. And also who reads your file. A form, so a formulaic, on the other hand, would be some of those schools that only look at GPA and test scores. Um, and they don't really require a lot of those um, additional components of the application. So who reads your file? So this can be done, uh, it really again varies from one university to the next. They can be read by the admissions counselor. They might be um, evaluated by a committee. Sometimes more of the more, uh, some of the more selective schools might have a committee that meets once a week or once every other week to um, review several applications at once to decide who's admissible and who is not. 
um, and that can vary based on different kinds of programs, et cetera, what the faculty is looking for. And how many readers per app? This really is a variable thing to at each university. Again, this can vary um, depending on if there is a committee. Um, for my institution, um, usually I'm the only reader um, that reads the application unless I need a second look at a particular student for additional input from my director. So that can vary again. And so um, the other thing that varies from school to school, many, many things are dependent, but there you'll hear different terms like rolling admission, early decision, early action, and regular decision. Usually rolling admission means they don't have any really hard hard and fast deadlines. Likely they're going to tell you deadlines though just to keep you on track so you do submit that application earlier rather than later. Um, early decision is a binding uh, application. So what that means is say um, a school has an early decision date or deadline of November 15th or December 15th. What that means is those are the more selective schools. If you do apply to a school like that, typically you only want to apply to one because it does mean that if you are admitted to that particular school, you're basically agreeing that you're going to go there. Um, and then early action. So those dates can vary too. Um, many times uh, schools will have early action deadlines as early as you know, November 15th, December 15th. Those mean that when you apply to that school and if you are admitted, it does not uh, mean you're committed to that school. So it's not a binding contract. And so what do admissions counselors and or committees or universities consider in your application? So many components, obviously the personal information. Um, some of you have probably taken a look already at the Common application. It just opened, I think last weekend. Um, so there's the Common app um, and then many schools will have their own application as well. So we're going to look at all your personal data the rigor of the curriculum that you've um, been in, uh, enrolled in in your high school, your GPA, that is part of that as well. Any kind of AP courses or IB coursework that you've done. Test scores is a big one, SAT or ACT. We're gonna get a lot more into detail in these in a second. Any kind of activity that you've uh, been participating in, other attributes or awards, um, essay, uh, your essay and, or personal statement, any kind of supplemental information, demonstrated interest can be um, a very important thing that universities will consider to see how likely you might be to enroll there. And also if you are applying to an art school or some kind of performing arts, they might be looking at a portfolio that you need to submit along with your application. Okay, so for the personal information part, Obviously, you're going to uh, be indicating your gender if you choose to. Of course, that is um, variable from one person to the other. Um, it's not a requirement to tell us your gender, but many times we do look at that. Ethnicity, if a school is looking for a particular, um, looking to form their population in a certain area. So let's say they're looking to increase their international student population or something of that nature. They might look at ethnicity as part of the application process. Of course, any kind of citizenship, what countries you're from, um, demographic information, where you are coming from, and any kinds of um, you know, family orientation that shows if, if your parents went to college, what kind of um, careers they might be involved in, that kind of thing. Family information along with education history. So, so you might want to, of course, indicate if your parent went to that particular university, so you uh, will be notified or you'll, you'll be marked on your application as a legacy. That can be important to some universities, um, so that it really, again, varies from one university to the next. And, of course, any kind of disciplinary issues. Um, if you do have any of those that have happened along the way, it doesn't disqualify you from being admitted to a university necessarily, but it is important that you do um, indicate that on your application. Um, sometimes if students don't, that might, that might be found out later. So it's always good to be very honest and forthright. But many times when we have students that indicate they've had disciplinary issues, it's usually something very minor, and, um, but it's something that we do need to know about. So make sure you do use every space of your application 
appropriately, and we're going to get into more detail about that too. So like I mentioned before, the rigor of your curriculum is important to note. So we are going to be looking at your high school profile. Usually when you submit your application, that's going to be included with your counselor report. Uh, so we'll look at what kind of courses you've been taking. Again, as I mentioned, any kind of AP coursework, any IB coursework, if you have um, taken advantage of the AP or IB courses that are at your school, that's important uh, to some universities to see that you have really excelled in those areas. Doesn't mean you need to overload yourself though with AP or IB courses or especially APs um, because it does, that varies from university to university and it is better to keep in mind um, how that's going to affect your GPA. We don't want you to be totally stressed out taking too many AP courses either. So weighted versus unweighted. Um, many universities will look at this, but uh, I think by and large, for the most part, most universities will level the playing field. And so even if a school reports a weighted GPA, many times universities will unweight it or they'll be able to calculate what the unweighted GPA is. They might make it fair for everyone. Since some states um, that students are graduating from the high schools from those states, they do not even provide weighted GPA. So that's important to keep in mind too. And any kind of class rank. So really important to know that if your school does not rank though, um, for example, Seton Hall is one that actually does look at rank for um, academic scholarships. So if you are for for our intents and purposes, if you happen to be among the top 10% in your particular class, you could get a, a much higher scholarship for that, for all the work that you've put in to, to be at that level. But if, you're, if your high school does not rank, um, what, uh, what universities can do in that regard is call either the counselor or the registrar and they can confirm your rank. Okay, I mentioned test scores. So this is a hot topic of course this particular fall we've had a lot of meetings and, and different kinds of presentations with uh, high school counselors as well as independent counselors along this subject so SAT ACT scores most uh, students in a normal year would be taking one of these exams um, and um, important to note if they are still requiring this it's important to ask your admissions counselor do you super score most of the times universities don't um, prefer one over the other. SAT or ACT is perfectly fine. Super scoring means that if you have taken the SAT or the ACT or both of them and you've taken them multiple times, um, the, usually if a university super scores, that means they take the highest score from each of those times you've taken the test. So you will, it will give you the better advantage to, make, to um, receive a higher academic scholarship. Um, sometimes universities do require the writing section in the SAT. Um, it doesn't mean it's always um, uh, necessary, so important to ask your admissions counselor about that too. Um, and many times we do see that scores may not be consistent with your high school GPA. Um, very common because sometimes students do better on one or the other. And also sometimes students do better on the SAT versus ACT and vice versa. So if we do see that there's kind of an inconsistency there, we may uh, reach out to that student and find out, you know, what happened if, um, if there was something. And many times it is students have difficulties taking tests. So there are many test optional schools. This happens to be a year, as many of us know already, that many universities are going test optional because uh, I've talked to so many students that are planning to apply to my school, for example, that have had their uh, tests canceled multiple times. So um, just make sure you ask your admissions counselor that's something that has changed over the last year or two with that particular school. There are test optional schools that have existed for some time as well. So if that's important to you to know and um, the test has been something that has you've struggled with anyway, you might want to think about applying to a test optional school. And subject tests are also another area of the uh, ACT or, e or SAT score that you might need to know if you need to uh, be concerned with those particular scores as well. Usually students um, have the College Board send their test scores to the university directly. However, many schools um, also 
can grab that right off of your transcript. If it is included in your transcript, that will suffice as well. Okay, I mentioned a little bit about activities and your work resume. So these are things you can include if you'd like. So there's a part of the common application where you can list all these different kinds of activities, whether it be that you participated in sports, whether you participated in a specific club, whether you've had a leadership role at your, at your high school, et cetera. So there's a place for that. You can include a resume as well if you want. I would say the majority of universities don't require a resume, but if you'd like to put one together, you can always submit that as well. We do look at these things though. So we look at in, if any kind of um, leadership activities you've been involved in, like I mentioned, you could have been the um, captain of your football team or basketball team or what have you. You could have been the president of a club uh, involved in student government on your high school campus, et cetera, or any kind of things you're involved in as far as community service. That can also mean community service within your high school community as well as church or your specific environment that you live in. Also family responsibilities, that's a big one. So you might be um, an older sibling and you might take care of two or three younger siblings. This does happen quite frequently. So it's important to note that on your application as well because most admissions counselors are going to, if they're doing a holistic review, they're going to look at, well, there's a reason that this student couldn't participate in these kinds of extracurricular activities because they had a lot of home responsibilities. Um, and that can also be a job as well. So um, those are important to really keep track of and make sure you list. And I always tell students, when you're thinking about these activities, just start making a list. If you can't think of everything, ask your counselor, ask your teachers, ask your parents. You know, you might be forgetting quite a few things that could be really important on the application. So anything that you're going above and beyond is good to note. And any kind of things you can list that really show that um, connection to if you know you want to do a particular major or um, you're drawn to a particular university because of your what you're passionate about or what your community goals are, it's important to list that there too. Okay, like I mentioned, don't try not to overlook anything uh, that you can think of that really helps you stand out. Our job as admissions counselors is really to get to know you. Uh, many times, especially this year, since we will probably be doing a lot of things remotely or virtually, um, we won't get a chance to meet with you in person. Um, so it's, it's a, really our opportunity to get to know you through your application. So try to remember to awards in your high school, participated in Model UN, you've been part of the debate team, won awards for that, anything like that, try to remember to mention that in your application. And this is a big topic. So Amy, I don't know if you run uh, essay workshops, I'm guessing you probably do, but um, most of us also as admissions counselors, we've helped students try to answer a lot of different questions they have about putting together their essay or their personal statement. It is something that gives students a lot of, um, they get very nervous about it, uh, and uh, it's really not something you need to get nervous about. I think, especially this year, if you might have a little extra time, because we, you're probably going to be studying many times, um, students are going remote this year. So you might have more time to work on it. I think that that's an important thing to start doing earlier the better. It's a good time to start working on it during the summer before you get too busy. So um, I always th think of the essay or personal statement is like your interview on paper. So if you can think about all the things that really make you special, all the things that um, you want to share with the admissions counselor, just like you would in a job interview, think about those things and just um, come up with a, a, something that you can talk about that really tells the admissions counselor who you are. Of course, we want to get to know your personality, your values, um, any kind of thing you can tell us um, that makes you, that helps us get to know you better, whether it's um, that you, um, let's see, one that I really liked this year uh, was a student that um, had grown up in Kazakhstan. He um, learned to speak Russian there, but he was of Chinese descent. So from there, he moved to China and then he moved to California. So he had, 
he became fluent in all of these languages, but he also talked about how it, it really helped him grow and mature to the point where he realized he could understand a lot of different cultures and he has learned now to help his fellow students and those around him in his community to really understand different types of people and different cultures. So I thought that was pretty insightful. Um, but you know, you don't have to make it anything complicated. It could be something very simple that you can write your essay about. Um, if you do have questions about that, I'm sure your particular counselor at your high school will be happy to help you with that too. Oh, and Lisa, I, I, first, I want to um, second that. Absolutely. We have five college and career specialists within within our school district, and we love helping with essays. So um, ask those questions, have us proof them, and always be authentic. Um, there was a question in the chat box or the mm -hmm. chat, whatever that's called, about citizenship and how does that um, impact acceptance or your college applications. And so I know there's different layers of citizenship. So mm -hmm. if um, if that slide's coming up, please forgive me, but um, otherwise, do you mind taking a moment? Sure, not at all. Um, I don't think I was gonna touch on that again, but it can. It doesn't uh, mean necessarily that it will at many universities. Um, it can if a university is saying they're, want, they're wanting to increase their international student population, whether it be from you know, China or Europe or really anywhere. They just want to have a little bit more diversity on their campus. Some uh, universities might have um, a real mission to grow their, their, uh, their uh, what am I trying to say? Um, the variety of students on their campus, whether it be from, you know, population of students coming in. So it really, so yeah, it, it just depends. I hope that was helpful. So yeah, and um, any kind of supplemental um, information that you want to add on your um, application is important to add too. So right here, I do want to, to mention that, like I said, every university's application is going to be a little bit different. I know the UC schools, I believe they have four parts of, to their essay. So they're shorter essays than the Common App essay is uh, one that usually you stay within a word limit of 650 words. But um, each university is different. I believe I've talked to a Stanford admissions counselor once and she said they require several essays. So Again, that's going to vary from school to school. You can also submit a supplemental essay. So for example, this is where you'd want to include any information about, you know, did I have a bump in the road academically through my um, freshman and sophomore years because of a home situation, or I was injured, or I was really ill, or uh, many different kinds of situations can take place. Um, so these are, this supplemental information or supplemental essay is an area where you could talk about that if you choose. Also, it's an area where if you choose to, like, let's say you really have a desire to go to a particular school, you want to note that in a supplemental essay, you can do that um, in this area and talk about specific reasons why that particular university is very attractive to you and why you really desire to go there. So. Um, it's important though when you're, if you do choose to do this, um, many times we do see supplemental essays and or in the regular essay where students um, forget to change the name of the university and they might uh, accidentally put the wrong university in there when they're applying to, um, you know, X university there, put the university of Y in there. So it's really important to proofread, proofread, proofread. Um, Another thing I want to tell you about the essay before I leave, because it's such a big topic, is um, as you're writing your essay, once you've written it, and you might have five drafts of essays, read it out loud to yourself and, and ask yourself it if it really sounds like you. Uh, read it out loud to your counselor, to your friends, um, to your parents. Um, it's going to really help you get a good idea if, if that essay really truly reflects who you are. So, and it is a very helpful process. Okay, recommendation letters. So 
generally speaking, if you're doing the common application, um, there is a, a, a place for a counselor recommendation where your counselor can fill out a recommendation for you as well as a teacher evaluation or teacher recommendation. Generally speaking, I would say the majority of universities only require that one of each um, rec uh, a recommender, so a counselor plus a teacher. Again, this can vary from university to university and what their application requirements are. So some might require more. It doesn't mean you can only submit those. You can also submit additional ones. So um, it's important to note that when you're getting ready to fill out your application, what, what that's going to entail. Who should they come from? Like I said, a counselor or teacher, but what you wanna do is really be careful about uh, or select a good teacher that specifically knows your skills, your abilities, any kind of traits that you have, um, anything they can speak to about how you're involved in the classroom or the community. Obviously you wanna choose a teacher that knows you and can speak highly of you. Uh, that's very important. So all these kinds of character traits are important to include in, your, in those kinds of recommendation letters. Okay, and demonstrated interest. Now this is a part of the application process that can be very important to certain universities. Um, some, I would say some, maybe the majority of universities do track this, some definitely do not. Um, what does that mean, demonstrated interest? So what that means is if a student, um, let's say, at, from my perspective, if I go to your school and you schedule the time to meet with me, either in person or virtually, or you come to a college fair, a high school fair, and you um, fill out an inquiry card or let me know that you're very interested in my university, those are ways to show demonstrated interest. If you also go visit the university uh, for either like an open house or um, just to visit and take a tour, that's another point of interest that we might track. Um, and so these can, these parts of your application can be very important, it, not always to every university, but most of us do track it. The reason that it's important or can be important, um, for example, I'll just give you an example, if a student is kind of on the verge of not being admissible to a particular university, and then we see that, wow, they're really interested in our university. We're gonna take a gamble on them. So if a student is, is right on the edge of being admissible, it can kind of tip things in their favor so that we can admit them and enroll them eventually. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind, if there is an interview offered and you are very interested in that particular university, it's a very good idea to schedule that interview, whether it's over the phone, a virtual interview over the computer, or in person, um, interviews can happen in a number of ways. So uh, many times admissions counselors might interview uh, a student. Um, also alumni can interview students as well as faculty. So there's a lot of different kinds of interviews that you can potentially take, play, take part in, but um, it's always a good idea to do it if you're really interested in that particular university. Okay, I think we're getting towards the end here. Um, so hopefully I have a lot, hopefully I have a lot of questions. Um, so application game plan. So what, what should you be focused on doing? So now that it's summer and you guys are probably thinking about putting together your list, um, this is something we talk about. We try to uh, counsel students not to make your list too long or unmanageable because they can get pretty long. Um, Average students that I talk to, most of them will be applying to anywhere from 10 to 15 different universities. You certainly do not need to apply to that many if you don't want to. Um, so, but anywhere between that, um, that area is usually pretty common. I know some students apply to many more than that. But you do want it to be manageable because if, you, if your list starts getting too long, once you start interacting with that university and have a lot of um, admissions, um, or let's say uh, application uh, decisions coming your way, it can get very confusing and kind of complicated. So good to do that. Um, you're obviously going to look at all these different factors, right? When you're putting your list together and we talk about the different categories. So you might have three that are likely schools. So those schools would be ones that you're pretty sure you could get admitted to. Um, you kind of know what the average they're looking for and you fall within that range very easily. Those are ones you 
might want to put on your list. The middle one is your target school. So these might be schools that are a little bit, a little bit higher, um, a more, lo little bit more selective than your likely schools or just a different requirements. So you want to apply to a few of those. And then your reach schools. So these could be those schools that you'd be just so delighted if you got in, but it, it might be a reach um, depending on the year um, and the application pool that they have that particular year. But don't be afraid, don't be shy to apply to them because you never know um, what's going to happen and how they're going to be making their selections for that university or the different programs that, they're, that you might be applying to. So those are important things to keep in mind. Um, another thing I like to always throw out there, if you are applying to schools, make sure you reach out to your admissions counselor and ask them if there's an application fee waiver. Many times there are application fee waiver codes that you can use, um, and that can save your parents and you quite a bit of money um, if you apply to a few schools. So keep that in mind too. All right, and action items. So these are things to keep in mind as a junior, as you're right, rising in your senior year. Um, I know you're, if you are a rising senior, your junior year is likely over, um, but hopefully you finish strong. If you are a, a junior right now, obviously you want to really try hard. I know it, it's sometimes, um, I think this is going to be a challenging year for students after we've had kind of a challenging end to the last year. So try to stay focused, uh, get help when you need it. If you are going to be virtual, um, stay in touch with your teachers and your counselors and also your admissions counselors at different universities. So try to stay strong and take challenging curriculum if you can, if it's available. Again, start working on that essay. The sooner you start, the, the more time you'll have to kind of edit it, to fine tune it, to um, change it all up if you want to. So just make sure you get that started early because um, it can get, it's just going to get more stressful you wait. As we know, when you're a procrastinator, it can get very stressful. So um, again, communicate with your admissions counselor. One thing I want to really stress and emphasize to you, hopefully you've been talking to a few of my colleagues um, today from other schools, but, but we are advocates for you. We are trying, well, our goal is to really be helpful for you, helpful resources, as well as advocates. And um, we aren't scary or anything like that. So we love what we do as admissions counselors for universities and we love helping our students. So definitely stay in touch with your admissions counselor. Um, and then um, know what you're submitting to that particular university. So like if you do have the interview with a, uh, an admissions counselor, you can talk at length about what you're, what you're excelling in, what you're excited about and really tie that all together if you're in an interview uh, situation. And then if you um, have the um, ability to go visit a university or have that interview or just even talk over the phone with an admissions counselor, make sure you've done your research so you can talk, talk to them a little bit about questions you have about that particular university so that they know that you're really interested. So that's, if you are going to do the extra effort to show your interest, definitely know um, a little bit more about that university, just like you would if you were going into a job interview. And I think that's all I have for my presentation. Um, Amy, I didn't know if you wanted me to do a quick overview, like a quick one about Seton Hall or... Oh, I think you're muted. Actually, I would like to hear, you know, definitely a quick over, um, overview because Seton Hall is one of those treasures that a lot of our students don't know about. So, um, can you do you mind speaking just briefly about that and then after that I will stop recording okay great do we have before I do that do we have any other questions yet no I don't see anything in the chat box okay all right so this is one slide it gives you a lot of information on one slide but in a nutshell Seton Hall is um, a leading Catholic University we are located, as I mentioned earlier, just outside of New York City at 14 miles away. We, um, and it's only a 30 minute commute into the New York City area um, by train. We have about 6,200 students. So we are considered a medium sized university, but we're on the smaller end of medium. So it's still very personable. Average class size 21, 14 to one student to teacher ratio. 
um, we have over 90 academic programs that are very strong. I would say one of the things that students are very drawn to Seton Hall for is not only that we have a very strong dedication to servant leadership, but also that we are our proximity to New York City. So um, we are known for internships. We've been ranked number four in the country pretty consistently for providing internship opportunities to students. Our university is among the top 25 in the nation that um, with the highest paid graduates and their mid-career earnings is are 50% higher than the national average. So I'm gonna kind of flip through. This kind of gives you some ideas of some of the internships that our students have done. Um, some of the more popular programs are connected here. So we've got School of Communication and the Arts, which um, provides students many opportunities to work on the major TV networks, radio stations, even on Broadway. We also have a School of Diplomacy and International Relations that's very popular with an exclusive alliance with the United Nations of America. Um, so students can work at the UN, they can study in Washington DC for a semester and work at the White House. Um, they can work for an embassy domestically or abroad um, among a number of other public service organizations. Um, great business school program. Our business school offers a lot of really practical experiences too. So we've got a market research center. We have a mock trading room where students trade with the real fund of money. They can get Bloomberg certified to go work on Wall Street. Um, we also have a sports polling center where ESPN works directly with our students to conduct sports polls on various issues. And then we've got uh, a number of health healthcare career uh, programs. So we offer a four plus three or seven year medical degree program. We also have dual degree programs or they're basically six year programs, three plus three for physician assistant, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech and language pathology. And we do have a direct entry nursing program as well. Uh, let's see. And we've also got, I would see what I'm forgetting. We, we have lots of great programs. Um, we do have a new health sciences campus. That's where our um, medical school is located. We've got a great leadership program for all students. Um, number one business leadership program in the country now for five years in a row. What that does is it gives our students access to amazing leaders in their profession for internships as well as mentorship. And then we have a great generation one program. It's called the Gen One program for our first generation students where we offer them lots of great resources. Uh, and so uh, that's a fairly new program. And I think that's it, but um, I'm happy to take any questions about the presentation or about Seton Hall or whatever you'd like to proceed with, Amy. <laughs> okay, well, I'm gonna...